I'm going to turn. And because we're recording, you'll have to hit the continue button to stay involved in this. And um, for those of you who are on live, of course, you hopefully won't need it per se, but you, you will eventually have access to the recording of this and the other three events in this series. But it's because it's an extension process, we have to have them closed captioned and do some official things like that. So uh, as soon as they are available, um, we will be sending out an email to everyone with that. Um, but until they are available, uh, we won't be able to uh, uh, provide that opportunity quite yet. So with that, I'm going to mute myself until the end of the show here and turn things over to Ron. Okay, thanks, Scott. I think Scott sells himself a little short there. I think he could give most of this talk too, if not all of it. But I'm uh, um, going to talk today about small layer flocks and looking at the numbers. It looks like most of you are in that small flock size. Um, I, I will say that I kind of have a little bit about a lot of topics. <laughs> so I tried to pull out some things that would not be completely elementary, but for those of you who might just be getting started, there are some things there. Um, I guess my hope is that this will kind of bring up some questions if there are things that you'd like more detail about or, or didn't follow. So certainly um, feel free to ask lots of questions. But um, with that, we'll, we'll go ahead. Um, no. Happy Egg Month. May is Egg Month, so this is a good time to have this. So, um, if you weren't aware of that, and I, Scott kind of already talked about this, but again, this is more producing eggs for your own use, and and so we'll talk about selling product next week. So. Probably the first thing to think about, I think, is housing. You need to keep the chickens in. And, and those of you who already have chickens, obviously have crossed this bridge already, um, or probably. But, um, you know, some things to think about it. With laying hens, it really needs to be year-round housing. Um, I have heard of a few rent-a-flocks out there, but I don't think that's very common. So typically, you'd have year-round. Um, you know, I talked last week about meat birds and those you can get away with some pretty, pretty short term things because you don't have to worry about winter and, and things like that. You don't have to worry about nesting for the, the meat birds. So again, now you have to have nesting um, or most likely um, needs to be predator proof. And I just thought I'd talk a little bit about mobile versus permanent and I won't like I say, I know a lot of you already have this, so I'll go pretty quickly. Um, but here's a nice permanent coop, you know, that I think is, is a good example that you could have. Um, some things about permanent housing. Generally, it's safer because you can build it stronger, to keep predators out. You can have, you know, hook up water and electric and things like that um, more easily than with mobile and generally less day-to-day -day labor. Now, the flip side of that is you're probably gonna have to clean at some point and there'll be you know, a, a pretty heavy load of cleaning sometime throughout there. Um, tend to be more expensive, but I think really these kind of become some of the issue is if you noticed in that last picture, there's nothing growing inside that pen. And you're gonna see that in most all the pictures I have and pretty much in all your coops, I would expect that you don't have greens. Um, and so you can have issues with mud, you know, it can be a problem there. Parasite buildup, worm eggs can build up over time if you're using that same spot all the time. So that can be a concern as well. But here are some examples, again, you see, that just really nothing growing in there, but a nice solid netting over the top and it's good. Coop. Here are some more urban ones, um, but again, you get the same idea, okay. Um, this one maybe isn't quite so fancy, but it certainly serves its purpose as well. And again, there are probably as many <laughs> types of chicken houses out there as there are people keeping chickens almost. So um, a lot of different things will work. 
Just a little bit on some mobile possibilities, less cleaning because you can move them to a new spot. These can work for winter. They may not be as nice and, and protected. Um, you can have nests in them and I'll show you some examples in the next slide. Watering can be an issue because you probably won't have water hooked up there. You'll probably have to haul water to them or, or something like that. Um, if you have fencing, moving that can be a pain. But here are some examples. A lot of these are sort of variations on a, a running gears and a coop built on top of it. I've seen some with different wagons and things um, built. But um, again, nice thing about this is you can move to different range area where there's forage, there's greens, the manure doesn't build up. Hopefully worm populations don't build up, things like that. <laughs> there's another option. I'm not sure this one runs, but you could certainly move it to different places. So again, that's just a little bit on housing. Certainly there's we more information on housing if somebody wants some. Um, the next thing I think is to sort of think about a breed and I'll say here, you know, these are some somewhat specific if you want a certain eggshell color and maybe this should have fit with next week with selling eggs, but I think we we'll mentioned it here. Um, certainly if you want a lot of white eggs, leghorns tend to be probably the best producers. Um, and I think I've got that on the next slide as well. But brown eggs, again, if you really are into it for egg production and efficiency, what we call these sex-linked hybrids. Um, and they're called sex-linked because the genetics are set up that you can sex them when they're baby chicks, um, usually by their color, although it could be a spot on their head, things like that. And then there are some other sort of specialty things, some of these dark brown egg layers, and that tends to be a popular one, and then the blue and green colored shells. And I say Araconas here, probably most of you will not get true Araconas if you know the, the technical parts of it. You'll probably get Americanas or what are typically called Easter Eggers that are kind of just a, a cross with that blue and green egg shell color. But Again, those are some if you really specifically want certain colors. Um, there's the sex linked, typically sex linked red hen that you'll see. Um, and again, these are sort of if you're really looking at egg production and somewhat efficient, um, they'll eat less food per dozen eggs than others. Um, Then there are what I'd call dual purpose breeds. A lot of people like to have these because you can get straight run or hatch your own chicks, which I'll talk about in a little bit in a minute. Um, a lot of people would then process the males and keep the females uh, as laying hens. And you see here some of these, what we would call the American breeds, things like Plymouth Rocks and Rhode Island Reds and, and New Hampshire's, I guess Orpingtons are an English breed. Um, those tend to be pretty popular for this. The hens lay pretty well um, and the males get enough meat on them that they're not too bad to eat. So those are some that you might think of with dual purpose. Um, and then we have what I sort of affectionately call yard ornaments. There are so many different colors and shapes and sizes and, and just different things you can get with the chickens. And so this is where I think it kind of gets fun. Um, and if you're raising a small flock, you can you know pick and choose a lot of different ones the way whichever you like. Um, these won't lay as many eggs typically a year, but they'll lay eggs and, and you can have a lot of enjoyment out of them. Um, so we see some different ones here, lots of different colors. Um, get into some of the different feather patterns and comb types and things like that. Um, I could spend a long time here, but I, I will 
limit it. Um, some of the, again, different ones with, with crests and things like that. The silkies here are popular. Okay. Um, or one of each, right? There's nothing that says you can't pick a few different ones. Well, there is if you're limited to three or four, but um, you know, you can lim you can pick a few. I get the question a lot of times, is that okay to mix them like that? Generally, they do fine. Um, if there's a real size disparity, you might have some issues with the chicks growing them. You know, if you have little bantams and big chicks, you might see some issues. Um, the only other problem I've seen is if you had, say, a whole bunch of one color and then one or two of another color, you might see some issues with that. But if you've got a whole mix like this, it usually works very well. So again, that's a real quick thing on the different breeds. Um, we could get into that more if somebody wanted. What age to start? And I would say for most people with small flocks, at least getting started, I think buying chicks tends to be the best place to start. Um, you can get chicks either at a farm store or from breeders around. You can have them mailed to you, depending on how many you're getting. Um, it works pretty well. The chicks are generally pretty disease free when they come in. Um, you still need brooding equipment, but you can get away with not having incubation equipment and things like that. Um, if you're set up for it, and you have chickens already and you want to hatch your own or you want to start with an incubator, um, you can work on that too. And generally it works pretty well. Um, you'll either need a rooster or you'll need to get fertile eggs from someone else, okay? Um, which again, if you're in town can be a challenge because most places don't allow roosters, but you might be able to get fertile eggs. Um, you'll either need an incubation equipment, an incubator, or some place to put broody hens. I would not suggest just letting a broody hen brood in with your other chickens. Um, generally creates a mess because the other hens will lay in with her and you'll get eggs broken and things. The only other thing I'll mention there is if you're trying to hatch, sex-linked birds won't be color sexable for a second generation, okay? So, and I could get into that in detail if somebody's interested, but the genetics are not so that they will continue. There are a few auto-sexing breeds, but they're pretty limited. One other option, and this is probably more if you're looking at, you know, egg production from for the, the main purpose and not as pets or enjoy uh, having the chickens, but there are ready to lay pullets available and that can be nice. Um, you know, you don't have to have brooding. You can get them, they're usually vaccinated for things and, and they're good, ready to lay. So that's kind of some of the getting started stuff. And again, I'm, I'm kind of skipping over a lot, but uh, give you an idea. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about what I'll call some basic husbandry things. And if you saw last week, um, or maybe you've seen me talk before, I often talk about flaws and that's not picking at your mistakes or errors. Um, that is feed, light, air, water, and space. And that's kind of a way to think about a lot of things with husbandry and raising the chickens. Um, those five things encompass a lot of the things to think about and, and issues that you might have. So I'm just gonna go over each one and really pull out a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting or you might not have thought about with those. So feed, generally you start with a chick starter grower about 18% crude protein and you can really feed that up until they're ready to lay which is gonna be probably around 18 weeks for most breeds. 
um, 18 to 20, somewhere in that. Okay. Used to be we would talk about decreasing the protein levels and things, but from what I've seen, you there's not a lot of different options available for feed. It's usually a starter grower. So. Um, adding what I'll call forage, pasture, and greens. Um, Definitely, once the chicks get a couple weeks old, you can start them in on this. I know Scott said last week that he starts his on grass, um, you know, after just a week or two. So um, you can you can start on that. It certainly will add, you know, vitamins and and what I'll call environmental enrichment. It gets them out and pecking at things and and moving around and exercising. Um, as they get older, especially, it will add a lot of pigments. So you'll get nice orange egg yolks um, if your birds are out on that. Um, <clears throat> I hope it's still going. It says my internet is unstable. Um, I would say if you're gonna have them eating, you know, vegetable trimmings and or out on grass and plants, I'd suggest providing grit, okay? And grit is just little rocks that they would eat um, that help them, it goes to the gizzard and helps them grind their feed, okay? If you're just feeding a mash, you don't really need to do that or a crumble that's already been ground up. But if they're eating plant material like this, I would suggest grit. And you'll note, I said here, not calcium carbonate, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit later, feeding oyster shell or limestone or things, but that shouldn't be given to the growing chickens. And I always mention this, I, I hear these people say that, oh, if you're out, if they're out pasturing, you cut back on their feed so much. And, and I don't think that's really true. And I've seen some research that that's not true. Um, but uh, it, it certainly, can give them a lot of other things. I just don't think you can plan on not feeding them if they're out on that. And I will say, Scott mentioned last week, and he's definitely right. If you have a lot of insects, um, you know, worms, things like that, those can certainly be good and they can cut back on it. But the plant material probably is not gonna provide a lot of, of feed replacement. About 18 weeks, we'll switch to a layer feed and that will have higher calcium. I always suggest just provide extra calcium anyway. Give them a feeder full of, you know, limestone or oyster shell. They'll eat what they want. So um, it can be good to have that. Last thing on feed, I think I have. This can be an issue, especially with people with just a couple of chickens. Um, we kind of want to spoil them and give them treats, scratch grains. That can be fine. You can use that for training them to come in at night and things like that. But you do want to limit the amount. It's usually high in energy and low in protein and fiber. And so you can get some issues where if they're taking, if you're getting too much of that, they don't eat enough of their regular diet and you can run into some imbalances there. So. All right, so that's kind of, again, a couple things on feed. Lights are kind of interesting, I think, and there's been a fair amount of research on lighting with laying hens in the last few years. There was a lot of old research and then it's kind of resurged again. Um, lights are very important for laying hens because chickens are what we call long day breeders. And so typically days like we have right now when the days have been increasing, um, that stimulates them to start breeding and reproducing and laying eggs. And I saw somebody commented they had a couple old chickens that just lay in the spring, right? Well, that's that increasing day length stimulates them to do that. And then typically, as we get to the fall and the day lengths start decreasing, then they will stop laying eggs. That doesn't always happen, but it 
It certainly can, and especially with older hens, it's more likely to happen. Um, generally, you want to grow them on short days during their pullet phase. So during that, say, 10 to 18 weeks or so, you'd like them to be on short days. And by short, I mean, you know, 10 hours or less if you can, but you can get away with 11 or 12 maybe if you don't increase it. Now, some of the last research that's kind of interesting is, is looking at colors. With the LED lights that we have now, you can really control what color you want to provide. And so there's been a lot of work. And what they found, I'll say in a nutshell, is blue tends to be better for growing birds. And red tends to be better for laying eggs or reproducing. So if you can change the color on your lights, that might be something to, to mess around with. Now, one other thing that I'll, I'll just mention, and I've seen this in a couple different places, um, you can have some issues with lighting if it's not used right, okay, or if you have a certain seasonal issue. And one of the places we see this is if the chicks hatch, say, in midwinter or early winter, they actually then well, let's say, you know, around in the December, early January, sometime there. And I know a lot of people do this to try to have chicks ready for fairs and things, but you can run into problems where they then, when they're about say 12, 14 weeks old, somewhere in that range, they get stimulated by these long days and the spring, the increasing day length. And you can get them to come into egg production too soon. And you might think that's not a bad thing. And I've seen people brag about it. Oh my gosh, I had chickens laying at 15 weeks of age, right? Two things happen with that. One is they often have really small eggs and that sometimes stays with them throughout. And I'll give you an example of this. We have at our lab on campus, we've put chicks out. So they come out of our chick room and they go out on into the pens and that is lighted for the adults. And we see that we get really small eggs out of those hens and it just stays small because their body haven't developed. The other thing is you can get increases in prolapse, which I've got a nasty picture on the next slide, I'll warn you, um, of a hen with a prolapse. But this is where um, the oviduct everts when she lays an egg and then doesn't pull back in. And you can have problems with that with these hens that come into production too early. So that I think is, is maybe worth talking about that it's kind of interesting. The other thing with light, artificial light, most of you probably know this, but you can prolong the long days and make the chicken think that it's eternal spring, right? That the days are long by having lights on on a timer. Traditionally, we'd start about September 1 and you would keep the lights on for about 14, 16 hours of light. Um, and usually then the hens will continue to lay throughout the winter. It's not perfect and eventually they'll stop, but it'll increase your egg production. So that's a couple things on lights. Um, oh, I should say too, I know I get a lot of people comment and it's very true. That's your personal decision whether to use artificial light. Some people say, I don't think that's good. I want the hens to be natural and go out of production in the winter and that's perfectly acceptable. Just a little on air quality, and I'm not gonna go deep into this, but you do need ventilation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with some winter coming up, okay? Chickens produce a lot of moisture, and so we have to get that moisture out or we're gonna have problems. Likewise with water, not a whole lot. Fresh, clean, cool water is good. Um, for the birds. Now that can be a problem in winter, keeping it thawed. I'll mention that. 
space. Usually if you only have a few hens, this isn't too bad. Um, I guess some of those of you who have 75 or so might run into some issues with this, but generally we would say as a minimum, three to four square feet per hen. Um, and the question that always comes up then is, is that indoors or with the run? Um, I would say if at all possible, have that three to four square feet indoors for them and then run extra. And the reason I say that is, especially in the winter, there's probably gonna be a lot of days where they will not get out of that indoor section um, or at least not very much. And so if you think, well, they've got run, I don't need to give them much space inside, you may run into issues. So again, really quick, but mention a few things there. I wanna talk then about some common problems or things you might encounter. And I know it's gonna get long, so I'll try to go through this stuff, but these are some things to think about. So there you go, winter. I think it's safe to say you're gonna encounter winter here with, in Wisconsin with your chickens. Um, this guy has had a little too much winter. This is all frostbite, this discolored section and this part of his waddles. That's all dead tissue and that's gonna fall off eventually. So if you were to see this rooster the following summer, he would have just a flat comb kind of where this red is and his waddles would be about half the size, okay? So we wanna avoid that. And that goes back to what I was saying about ventilation. Um, we really need to get the dampness and the moisture out of the air will help prevent that. Um, breed choice can have an effect as well. So if you are planning that you're not going to have any heat and it's going to be, you know, leave them in the cold situation. And I know a lot of people do in the state. Um, you might want to think about getting chickens with smaller combs. Pea combs or at least small um, rose combs or single combs. Probably don't want to get big leg arms or hamburgs with the big rose combs, things like that. Okay. They're probably going to have frostbite issues. So that's where I think the breed type. Also, the feathering. If you get birds with loose feathers, they are more insulated versus one that has really tight feathering. Okay. So you can think about that. Keeping them with water is important as well in winter. Not so much with frostbite, but having water available for them is, is good. Okay. So I always say, and I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, but I think you should consider having some heat or at least a water heater to keep the water thawed so that they can, can have water to drink. Um, again, they'll survive usually and, and people get away with it, but I think it's something to consider. Um, lastly, with winter, frozen eggs are a concern. So you do, if you wanna get eggs, you need to gather them pretty quickly if they're gonna be out there in the cold. Um, eggs that freeze usually crack. And then even if you do thaw them out, the yolks are usually kind of rubbery and, and not very good. So. The opposite of that, think about summer heat. And I would say laying hens typically do pretty well in our summers. You know, I talked about this last week with the meat chickens. They struggle because they're big and heavy and meaty. Um, laying hens usually do better. If you can provide cool water, shade, and ventilation, those really help. A um, couple of things that I think are kind of interesting about the heat, and, and these maybe you aren't aware of. First of all, it can decrease feed consumption. So if they're hot, they don't want to eat. And so if they're not eating, they're probably not going to lay as many eggs. So it can cut down on your egg production. The other thing is it can cause poor shell quality. 
And the reason for this gets kind of interesting, but it actually, when they pant, it changes their oxygen levels and CO2 levels in their blood, and then they can't move calcium from their blood to make eggshells. And so the panting is actually what causes the problems with shell quality. So you'll see this a lot of times that you get thin shelled eggs if the hens are panting all the time. Okay. So kind of a, an interesting side note, I think. Before you move on from temperature issues, yep. Heidi asked in the chat, uh, back away in the chat, but so don't look for it, but she asked about dealing with winter when she doesn't have electricity to the coop. So are there, are there alternative ways to try to either provide heat or water, you know, liquid water opportunities when she doesn't have electricity as an option, at least not right now? Yeah, great question. Um, I think I've seen actually a solar thing for water, but I can't swear to that, but I think I have. But otherwise, um, insulation is helpful, you know, a little bit, it will help. Um, a lot of people will stack straw bales around the, the coop to help insulate. Little bit can be an issue with rodents, but generally that's not a bad thing to have for that. Um, so that can help. <laughs> More chickens, that's always helpful because they'll produce body heat. Um, you know, where I said three to four square feet per hen, that might be a situation where you'd like to close that in a little bit so that um, they don't have such a big area. So that could be helpful. Um, Ron, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is it, um, is it possible, because I can run, um, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but um, I can run uh, it, like a extension cord down to where the coop is. But I didn't know, so like I've seen those waterers that you plug in, are those kind of the better ones to get like with the heater around the base, number one? And then number two, as far as a heating lamp goes, is it best to get like a flat panel one for, cause it's a, like a 10 by 12 coop situation. And I just didn't know, like I don't have electricity actually at the coop, but I could run an extension cord down. Yeah. Um... So I think water heater would be the first thing I'd look at. And yeah, the base ones tend to work. Um, you know, I've seen some where they go in the water, but probably the base ones are, are usually the most common. Um, as far as a heat lamp versus a flat panel, I guess I would probably say the flat panel is a little safer. Um, you, you do really have to be careful with the heat lamps to make sure they're, they're tied very securely um, because I've certainly heard stories of people knocking them, chickens knocking them down and burning the coop down, right? Probably, ideally, the, the panel and not a, a light is probably better from what we talked about earlier with the lighting, although sometimes it's a trade-off there whether heat is better than than having optimal 14 hours of light. So, um, but yeah, I, from what I know, a lot of people have had good luck with the, the panels. Okay, and then about how far, um, like above the chickens, would you put them or how far down from the ceiling? Yeah, and that you kind of have to play by ear. The one thing I would say is, you know, again, be safe. Um, so up high enough that it's not in the litter or things. Um, I, I think it doesn't have to be warm, warm. So any place you put it, you know, it's going to take some of the edge off and, and warm it up a little bit. So, um, yeah, so I don't know if I can give you an exact answer, but I think anywhere would be helpful. Okay, thanks. And then so question. Oh, go ahead. Um, what could you pour hot water in there in like your dishes? 
Yeah, so that's another option. If you don't have power there, I would say, um, you know, ideally, if you can get them water twice a day, that's helpful um, because it's going to freeze, you know, within an hour or so, probably, if not, depending on the temperature. Um, one thing there, if you get some of these, I always call them hog pans, but some rubber pans, those work well because you can knock the old ice out easily. If you have something else that, you know, plastic is going to get destroyed, metal, it's hard to get them out. And so those rubber ones tend to work well for that. And then you can have, you know, switch out the ice and put fresh water in. So, yeah. Good. All right. This one, I would say, is a problem for a lot of people. And it's really a challenge. Um, if you can prevent them starting egg eating, it's really better than trying to stop them once they've started. Um, chickens, once they start eating eggs, they know it's good, nutritious food for them and they really go after it. Um, so things to prevent it, good eggshell quality first. That's what happens a lot of times is you get thin eggs or cracked eggs and then they start eating those, break them in the nest and eat that. Um, frequent gatherings so that they're not sitting around in the nest to break. Um, I always like nest curtains. And so basically this is just a cloth hung across the front of the nest and attached on top, but you can leave the sides and bottom open and they'll, the hens will go in, but it keeps it darker. It, they don't see the eggs as much if they're walking by. Um, and it'll probably encourage the hens to go in there and nest as well. And then have good, clean, soft nesting material if you can, okay? Um, and, and those things will go a long way to stop them from, from starting the habit to begin with. Once you find one that is eating eggs, it can be a challenge. I know some people have had good luck with, I'll say, fake eggs, putting golf balls in there or wooden eggs. Um, some people have had luck with filling an egg with mustard or something. I, I, in my experience, that has not always been that wonderful, but I know some people say it works. Um, Beak trimming is a possibility where you can blunt the tip of their beak. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to do that, but that can help with them from breaking the eggs as well. And then there are a lot of plans out there for rollaway nests where the, the bottom of the nest is sloped and the egg rolls away and is out of reach of the birds. So that might be something to consider if you run into this. But Again, if you at all, you can prevent it, it's much better. A little bit on diseases, and we could spend a long time here, but I, I won't, but I'll mention a couple of things. Um, biosecurity is certainly a big thing, and, and USDA has a lot of materials on biosecurity for backyard birds. Um, I'll just mention a couple things here. These guys, if you can avoid them in your coop, that's going to be important. Um, sparrows will bring in mites quite often, starlings too. The mice might not seem like too much, but they can carry a lot of bacterial diseases and things in. Flies, mosquitoes, things like that as well. Um, I mentioned here people. People also can be an issue. And so that's where a lot of our biosecurity focuses on keeping people from bringing stuff in, okay? Don't bring, don't go visit somebody else and then track something back on your shoes or your clothes, things like that. If you're gonna go to a swap meet or a show or something, if possible, wear some different shoes, um, wash your clothes when you come back, things like that, so you're not tracking stuff back. Use clean equipment. Again, 
Don't bring something back on a cage or a feeder or something that you got. Buying clean stock. And what I mean by that is, if at all possible, bring, don't buy a disease when you're buying chickens or picking them up. I hear this so many times that, you know, I got some chickens from the neighbor down the road and now all my chickens are sick, right? Or I bought some at a swap or something and, and now they're sick. Um, so you try to be careful of that and only buy from people you know that are clean. Keeping wild birds and other animals out, I mentioned that. And usually the question comes up about vaccination. I put this picture in because this is pretty common, this 10,000 doses. And so it really is a challenge for somebody with 15 chickens or 20 chickens, um, first of all, to find these vaccines, um, to use them. A lot of times they have to be mixed in, you know, a, hundred gallons of water or sprayed on the birds or things like that. Um, they're not cheap because again, a lot of times you have to buy 10,000 doses. I would say for most people, in most flocks, if you can get a Marix disease for chicks that you're buying, um, that's usually helpful. Okay. Beyond that, unless you know that you have a specific health problem on your farm, I would say there's probably not many vaccinations uh, that I would suggest. So. Parasites, lice and mites, everybody can start itching now when I put this up, right? This is, is typical of mites. You see this little red bugs and, and crud, I'll call it, build up there. Um, again, if you can prevent them, it's much better. Keeping the sparrows out of your flock and other birds out of your flock can be helpful there. Dust baths probably help prevent them a little bit. Um, scaly leg mites, I'm not sure that a lot of people have trouble with those, but um, occasionally you run into that. There's little mites that crawl up under the scales of the legs and um, they cause this, again, crud, for lack of a better term, buildup. These you can usually treat pretty well. You can suffocate them with a Vaseline or a petroleum jelly, something like that. And I'll say worms, <sighs> worms are probably present in a lot of small flocks, but usually they don't cause a big problem. The hens might have a few worms and you know, live with them. Um, but once in a while, you can run into problems with them. I will say in the last couple of years, there's been a new um, treatment that's now approved for laying hens. So that's new. Up until about three or four years ago, I would have to say there's nothing approved for laying hens. But now there is. Before you get off this slide, a question came in regarding the best control options for lice and mites. You talked about scaly leg mites a bit, but yeah. are there better options? I mean, I know a couple of the options, but uh, you've seen a lot more of them in practice than I do. Sure. So as far as things that are approved for use in chickens, um, the permethrins, I would say, are usually what I suggest starting with. Um, and these are pretty safe um, and pretty available. And a lot of times they work. I'll say there are some resistant mites, but, but they usually will work. And you can spray those right on the bird. Also trying to clean out at the same time all the litter and nesting material and stuff, because a lot of times there's mites in that. But permethrins, um, there's a, a fairly new product out called Elector, I think it's Elector PSP, that it is very effective. Um, I think it's like $140 a bottle is the cheapest I've seen it. So, you know, for four chickens, that's pretty pricey. Um, but that one is approved. 
There are some others. There's one that calls itself a poultry enzyme, and I have not used it, but I've heard from some other people that it's pretty effective and it's acceptable to use. Um, then there's the old seven dust, which a lot of people used to use. That one, some people say it's still approved. I think from what I've seen, it says not to use it on poultry right on the label. That one gets to be a little bit, you wanna be careful using that one for yourself. Um, and then there are a lot of treatments that are not approved for chickens that I know a lot of people use out there. Um, you know, some of the different dog and cat ones and things like that, but those are, are not really approved. So I wouldn't suggest them. Oh, I should mention diatomaceous earth. That one always, I think, is, is out there. My take on diatomaceous earth, and I think from the few research studies I've seen on this, it's, it's held up. It probably will help as a preventative. So if you wanna have a dust bath and have some of that in it, it probably will help as a preventative. I don't think it will treat, if you've got a full-blown case like you're seeing here and you're seeing the mites, my experience and what research has been done on it says it won't really stop them. It might knock the numbers down a little bit, but it won't get rid of them. So. Okay. Is it a valid assist, keyword assist, to just to make sure that they have access to a good quality dust bath? Because uh, at least, and again, that's not the end all be all, but uh, is it true that it does at least make a difference? Uh, yeah. And again, I think if they have that before you get to this point, I think it helps to stop getting so you don't get to that point. I think it helps the preventative. Yep. I'm just thinking that for some of our listeners tonight that that may, that for people like me who live on sand, it's yeah. easy. It's literally wherever there's grass, they, they make their own dust baths. But for, <laughs> yeah. for people who have a smaller flock and maybe are, are in more managed areas, uh, that can be a little bit trickier. They almost may have to supply a, a dust bath type yeah. of situation. And just like a, a dish tub, you know, will work and, and some sand, um, wood ash, if you've got, I'll say clean ash from a nice wood, you know, so you know it's fairly clean, that can work in there too. But yeah, I think it's a good preventative. Yeah. Okay, good questions. Um, predators, again, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly, but I'll mention a couple things. You know, really the, the big thing I think is if possible, build like a fort so they can't get in, right? Um, raccoons tend to be a problem almost everywhere. Some of you probably are up there in, in bear country and things like that where you'll have more issues. Um, I'll give you some pictures here in a minute, but I think electric fencing can be pretty effective um, if you really, you know, have a problem. Um, I'll mention burying the fence and I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, obviously netting or wire across the top, you know, something because stuff can come in. Hawks and owls can come in, but also the raccoons can come in the top. So you want to cover that. Guard dogs can be good as long as they're not the ones <laughs> doing the, the predation, but um, Guard dogs can usually be good. And then depending on where you live and your situation, you know, again, traps might be an option, shooting might be an option, depending on your situation. Here's what I mean by burying the fence. And so if you can just put like hail screen or, or hardware cloth, something like that, and fold it out about a foot or so, that stops animals from digging under. They won't they hit that and, and stop. 
And here's an example. This is even a mobile coop where they've done this. So it doesn't have to be buried, but I don't know if, you, if that shows up well in the picture, but you can see they folded it out there and then have some rocks on it. So that can help keep stuff from digging in. Um, here's an example on the top right of electric fence where that will be pretty effective for keeping raccoons from climbing up the poles and getting in. Okay. Um, this on the bottom left, may be effective during the day. I wouldn't count on it at night, but it, it may be helpful during the day. I think this is my last problem. And I'll say maybe this isn't a problem, but if you've gotten past all of the predators and diseases and things like that, um, old chickens can be a bit of an issue for you. And I know somebody mentioned this in their their comments early on. Um, you know, chickens, I'll say, can live 10 to 12 years. I know I've heard of people having them live longer than that, but 10 to 12 is probably not terribly unusual. And egg production tends to decrease each year. So I've heard estimates of 20% per year. It probably isn't an perfect number like that. But you can imagine that each year you have them, they're going to lay fewer and fewer eggs. And so at some point, you kind of have to decide whether they are pets that you're going to just keep around or if you're worried about egg production. Um, and again, I think both of those are certainly viable options for you. Um, if you're not going to keep them as pets, you know, a lot of people will use them as stewing hens or sell them to someone else or give them to someone else to use as uh, a roast stewing hen. Um, so I think it's something to think about as to kind of what you're going to do with that. So <laughs> I've covered a lot of different things, um, but hopefully a few different topics that maybe were new for you. Okay, so the floor is open. So uh, if you have any questions that haven't uh, been addressed yet, I think if I caught them all, I think we've got through everything that was in the chat there that was put into the chat to this point. But if I if I did miss something, uh, either retype it in or just unmute yourself and then ask your question. Um, uh, or you can just you do either way, whether it's a, a repeat that we missed or something that's still on your mind. Can I ask about uh, ventilation a little bit? So um, in the coop, would it be if windows are up higher and then you leave the, you know, the chicken door open, would that serve as an appropriate source of ventilation kind of flowing, you know, if you left the windows cracked a little bit in wintertime? Yes, and it doesn't take a lot, but yeah, that would be good. Um, again, I think you just need a way for that moisture to get out. Um, I've told people if you go out in the morning and it's steamy, or if you smell ammonia, um, it's too damp, or if you really, if it's getting damp on the, the walls or, or the litter's wet, things like that. But yeah, it's, you just, it doesn't take a whole lot, but you do have to let that out. So I think that would work well. The other thing is you still want to watch predators. So, you know, make sure you're not leaving something open that a coon can get in. So. You know how you said um, to bury the fence? Yep. When, when we were building our coop, we um, had this wire mesh fence that we got from one of the stores. Mm -hmm. And we like stapled it to the posts. And then we put dirt on top of it. Would that work? Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I think just the, the idea is that it sticks out a little bit so that if something comes up to the edge of the fence and tries to dig under, they hit fence. And I don't know of any animal that knows enough to back up a couple feet and try to dig again. So usually that'll stop. A 
couple other things came into the chat. One regarding uh, mouse or other rodent control questions. Uh, so our suggestions for that. And then a, a comment as much as anything regarding gnats and, and or black flies as uh, Carolyn uh, correctly referred to them in the, a different chat to me. Um, causing issues with chickens last year. Um, and I know I'll be talking about gnats and ducks in a couple of weeks, <laughs> but uh, yeah. black flies can occasionally get serious enough that they will kill just about any kind of poultry in reality. Yeah, and it seems like in the last few years, we've had a lot of trouble with that. Um, maybe this year, since it's so dry, we, we won't have. Um, couple things there. I mean, if you can have moving air, that's very helpful. Um, you know, if you have electricity, you can put a fan on. Um, if you don't, keeping the birds indoors for that, usually it's only a couple of weeks that it's a big issue. So if you can keep them in for that time, that might be helpful. And I know I saw somebody at netting or screening um, to keep them out. Yeah, those tend to be the biggest things. There's really no way to stop them that I know of. They can travel from what I've seen in a few miles. So it's not like you can do something on your farm to get rid of them. Um, so yeah, bug sprays and stuff. Maybe if you're in close area, they can be helpful. Um, so. Yeah, if you're willing to do it, there are some uh, premise treatments that yeah. some uh, insecticides that, that will assist again i'm not going to say they're perfect either and not everyone's going to want to use them <laughs> um uh so but it, it, they're less likely to cause problems inside of barns and buildings than inside of mobile coops that's one thing too so if especially if you still have smaller birds they're probably the ones that are a little bit more uh, exposed to the issues that that gnats and black flies can have uh, or can cause sorry um, but that they are tricky uh, especially when we get a really tough year um, and it, it this happens in wildlife too um, you know there are you know, I can I can show you or I, I can't show you but I know that there are studies done by DNR personnel especially in some parts of uh, Minnesota where black flies kill almost all of the loon chicks in certain regions every year because they're that you know horrendous too so um, and uh, Kami or Kami does talk about vanilla vinegar that does deter, and that is something that that I or that we have tried at our place too. Are some of the vanilla-based products, and that can help with gnats. It doesn't do any, doesn't seem to do anything against mosquitoes, but it does. <laughs> but most chicks like mosquitoes. The the gnats are more of a problem for them. But the, there are there is a little bit of a repellency effect there from various uh, vanilla based products. So, and then uh, Ron, if you had specific things on rodent control, one of the things that I always talk about with people is making sure that you have good sound <laughs> building and uh, you know, especially where your feed storage is because that's usually what attracts them into a place to begin with. Um, and you know, having good cleanliness and cleaning your coop consistently and all those kind of things. Yeah, I, I agree. I think two things I usually push are keeping feed away because that's usually what attracts them. Um, and so hanging feeders quite often are helpful. If they're up high enough, the chickens can still reach the feed, but the mice can't get up in them. That's one. Um, if you really have a bad infestation, you know, take the feeders out at night. It's kind of a headache, but um, and like store your feed in a metal container so they can't get to it, things like that. Um, and then nesting areas as well. Don't have boards piled up or things that they can you can get in under, but yeah, and the solid coop, like you mentioned. And also beware of the daytime cute ones. Um, I had a, my best friend had um, a flock for a while and I 
think I could probably have verified that chipmunks ate more of his poultry feed than his chickens did because it was almost a steady stream of chipmunks running from the woods to his coop and back. Yeah. <laughs> so you do have to beware of the the cute rodents as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions or comments that anyone has? I think we've gotten through Unless I missed something, I think we got through everything that was entered into the chat. I was looking through there a little bit. I would say and one thing I see here commenting about sunflower seeds and, and corn, and those are kind of what I was talking about with treats. I think I would mm -hmm. try to limit those. Sunflower seeds tend to be pretty high fat, so they're pretty high energy. You can use a few, but just don't overdo it. Yep, that's true. I, I, I did forget to bring that back up. But yeah, whole whole corn is a cheap treat that is still pretty good for them too. So yeah. Um, Again, now, just kind of keep it limited. A mm, couple more that have come in. Um, th there's kind of the the slightly cynical answer to the first question as far as what can be done with excess roosters but that is actually a serious question that we probably should have talked about at some point is the number of roosters per number of hens because it is one of the most common problems that i deal with people in small flocks is that they have too many roosters for yeah. the number of hens that they have i was guilty of that as a kid um <laughs> i would say Traditionally, we would say one rooster for about every 10 hens, um, something in that ballpark. I, you can probably get away with two roosters for that without too much trouble. I always get a little, especially if you're breeding birds, it's always kind of pushing it to say, I'm only keeping one rooster because if he has something happens to him, they're, they're gone, right? Um, but somewhere in that ballpark is usually good. And of course they'll hatch out roughly 50-50. So you're gonna end up with excess roosters. Um, there are breed differences too. Um, yeah. you know, there are some breed associations that their, their information will directly say one per 25 because their roosters are just more aggressive. Um, you know, for myself and our flock, we've found more like one to 20 is about right. <laughs> We <laughs> give or take. <laughs> um, another real good question came in regarding, and we'll come back maybe to the fencing one that Alexis talked about. But Cameron asked about if what what are some things that they might be able to do if they're not getting eggs. Yeah, um, and especially if it's this time of year because right now should be prime time for for laying um you know some of it's the age of the birds i would say again if they're you know four five six years old you're not going to get very many if any um but if they're one or two i would expect you'd be getting eggs now um you know, make sure their feed is good. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other, I mean, if, if they appear healthy and don't have any other issues, then it's, it's kind of hard. The other thing I would definitely check is whether they're laying eggs and you're just not gathering eggs. Um, and what I mean by that is something eating them, whether they're eating them or a cat or the a rat or a raccoon or possum, snake, things like that. Lots of things like to eat eggs. So that would be one op one thing to look at. Another one, if they are out where they can be laying somewhere else, you know, if they're under a shed somewhere or in a barn somewhere, they may have found a different place. And you run into that and all of a sudden you find 30 eggs in a nest, right, that they've been laying. So. Those would be some things I would look at. Okay. 
Um, Colette asked about broodiness. She didn't uh, ask specifically, but that's what she's referring to. Uh, and is is there any, and that's actually a good question though, is is there anything that can be done about broodiness? I mean, I, again, I know that there are some, some breeds that are naturally more broody than others. Um, and, and certain times of the year, you know, they're more likely to do that, but are there any techniques to try to minimize it? Yeah. As far as, as preventing it, the turkey people have done a lot of work on this and things like, um, you know, gathering eggs frequently so there's not a nest of eggs there can be helpful. Um, they do some different things with, with temperatures, and, but I would say that can be helpful, pushing them off the nest a lot. Um, once they've started going broody, the best way I know of to stop it is, and it seems a little mean, but if you have a cage that you can put the hen in, and especially if you can hang it up or have it up on bricks or something so there's air blowing underneath her, don't give her any nesting material at all, just a bare bottom cage. Um, and usually a day or two of that will, will break them up. Um, you know, it, it just, there's no nest there and it cools them underneath. So that's the best thing I've heard to break them up. Uh, I see a dog kennel. I mean, it, if you can, it just, um, you know, again, ideally you'd like some air underneath or if, if the dog kennel has a solid floor, it may not work real well, um, but you can try it. Yeah, we didn't talk about what broody meant. That's a good point. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, we're question about roosters and, and a couple questions there. Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> first of all, the one about aggressive roosters, and I'll, I'll say my experience with this, I can mention any breed and in a group this size, I'll have one person say, I had those and they were the calmest, sweetest roosters I ever had and one will say I had those and you they fought constantly so I, I think there's a lot of variation within the breeds that being said I mean some of the more aggressive you know game type birds are more aggressive certainly probably the lighter layer types Mediterranean breeds if you're familiar with that maybe tend to be a little more aggressive um, some of the more heavier coachings and things like that may be more docile. Um, far as once they've started fighting, that can be tough. Usually they'll work it out that one will beat the other one. And I don't mean beating, but win and, and they'll kind of settle it. But sometimes that doesn't happen. All right, did I miss any? I don't see any others that we've missed, but if I have uh, somebody or whoever put it in, holler, holler out or retype it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so in our last couple of minutes here, does anybody else have any other any other questions or any other topics that they wanted uh, discussed? While you're thinking, I'll remind everybody um, we have, there are two more sessions in this series. Next week is oriented toward uh, producers who are selling poultry products. We are going to be fairly specific in that regard. Um, we're going to start off the evening discussion with the presentation from the DATCAP perspective. So really focusing on the, the laws of the state of Wisconsin on what uh, types of licensing and permitting you need to do and things you need to follow to meet the food safety and uh, poultry 
uh, laws. Uh, and then we'll also, uh, Ron's going to be talking about some cost management uh, techniques and a few other things along those lines. And then um, we'll kind of tag team on some marketing things. <laughs> um, and then two weeks from tonight, we're going to deal with non chicken poultry. So we're going to be focusing on things like uh, turkeys, guinea fowl, ducks, uh, geese, maybe a little bit. And if you, there are other oddballs out there, we'll try to <laughs> get resources to you if we don't know the things. Um, uh, so I, I, yeah, that's right. There was one thing I did as far as keeping chickens out of the road. Uh, really good fencing, <laughs> nine feet tall. <laughs> uh, but Ron may have some other options. <laughs> well, um, that can be a challenge. I mean, I guess trying to take them somewhere, attract them somewhere else, I guess. But, um, you know, potentially even one thing that I found a little bit as a kid anyway, was if you don't let them out quite all day, they don't tend to roam as far. So that might be something only let them out, say, you know, late afternoon, if they've got enough pen otherwise. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I don't try to <laughs> attract them somewhere else, feed them somewhere else away from that so that they're less likely to go there maybe. Yeah, the, the farther away that their food and water is from the areas where you consider to be problematic, are that's a good thing. Um, and making that making the area between their primary living area and those danger areas just less can less interesting to them, you know, uh, whatever that may be for your situation, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different there. One other thing, I guess, along that line, if it's a gravel road and they're going out there for grit, I mean, that might be something to provide grit somewhere else, but I, I wouldn't bet that's the issue. Yeah. Um, and then Megan and Colette are both interested in knowing about the thoughts, at least, on building your own coop or buying a kit. I'm too cheap to buy a kit. That's me. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there are certainly options. I would be a little careful with some of the kits that they're solid enough. I've heard some comments that they're not necessarily raccoon proof sometimes um, if they're using some pretty thin materials. Um, and yeah, you probably can build it yourself if you're a little bit handy for cheaper. So. All right. Well, that's what I have, I think. Did I freeze up or did we lose Scott? I'm not hearing Scott either, but. <laughs> If you guys need us in the future to contact us at the Division of Extension or your local extension agent and they can contact or get you in contact with one of us. Um, if you have any questions about your 4-H project, you can ask your 4-H uh, leader or your extension 4-H educator. So I'm glad you all visited with us tonight and have a great night. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Have a good night. <laughs> oh.
Okay, Ryan, can you hear me now? And now, yeah. Okay, something must have goofed up with my thing. Um, you uh, probably want to hit the recording. Oh.